أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفمن يعلم أنما أنزل إليك من ربك الحق كمن هو أعمى إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب الذين يوفون بعهد الله ولا ينقضون الميثاق والذين يصلون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويخشون ربهم ويخشون ربهم ويخافون سوء الحساب والذين صبروا ابتغاء وجه ربهم وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا سرا وعلانية ويدرؤون بالحسنة السيئة أولئك لهم عقب الدار جنات عدن يدخلونها ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم والملائكة يدخلون عليهم سلام عليكم بما صبرتم فنعم عقب الدار والذين ينقضون عهد الله من بعد ميثاقه ويقطعون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويفسدون ويفسدون في الأرض أولئك لهم اللعنة ولهم سوء الدار الله يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر وفرحوا بالحياة الدنيا وما الحياة الدنيا في الآخرة إلا متاع ويقول الذين كفروا لولا أنزل عليه آية من ربه قل إن الله يضل من يشاء ويهدي إليه من أناب الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب We'll just speak generally about the importance of dhikrullah and the importance of the sunnah of our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to understand that getting to the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam requires a lot of dhikrullah a person needs to do a lot of dhikrullah a lot of salat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that the heart can be cleared of all, from all of the, the duskiness and, and, and the dirt and the filth that accumulate in the heart and so that the amrad, the sicknesses that, that we have been affected with over many years of love of this dunya and uh, pride and arrogance and ignorance and uh, yeah, hatred uh, towards one another and all of these things, these are all sicknesses of the heart. So all of these sicknesses can be cured through the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so that all of these sicknesses can be cured and then once the um, the heart has been cleared from all of these diseases and then we uh, bring, bring in new furniture. If you have got a new house, just bought it, mashallah, you and your family are going to move in. And there there's old wall wallpaper on there from the 60s, you know, and uh, old furniture that stands there, look at you and, you know, it just makes the house look ugly. You're not going to keep it there. You're going to get the skip, we're going to ring the council, say, listen here, when can you come and pick up some old sofas and old cupboards? Get rid of them. Get your skip outside and take out all of your old kitchen and covers and, and, and units, take it all out and keep it an empty shell. And then you're going to start adorning the house, make it nice, get new wallpaper, 
new wallpaper, get new carpets, get, give it a new smell, right? Complete the refresh and rejuvenate the house, refurbish, we call it. And uh, then you move in. No? The same with the heart. It's called tahliya. Sorry, it's called takhliya and then tahliya. Takhliya comes from the word khala, which means clear and empty. Takhli, also another term, can be used. So you need to clear the heart from all of this rubbish. Get it out. Then after that, you bring in tahliya. Tahliya is adornment. You put on your chandelier. You don't put on your chandelier when you've got these old sofas in the, in the house. <laughs> it's not going to look nice. The brand new sofas for DFS. Now, full leather. The best kind. You put them in and you hang a chandelier. Then it looks nice. A nice beautiful frame. Get these old frames out. You don't know who lived there. Might have been uh, somebody who didn't believe in Allah. Take them all out. And then you beautify your house. This is the, uh, the process or the method of, uh, of getting the heart reattached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sunnah of his beloved Rasul. No? So we have over the years and as we grow up, you know, we've been playing computer games, we've been desensitized from all of these evil that's on the computer games. We've been, we've been uh, uh, you know, shooting people left, right and center. Right or wrong? Right. And we have been watching all sorts of things on the TV and our eyes is a unique, is a unique creation. Is a unique creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this eye so unique that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if I take your eyes away, you become blind and you be patient with that test and that calamity. The trial Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you through. Jannah is yours. Jannah is yours. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very unique creation. And the ulama say every single thing has a stomach. And a stomach, the nature of a stomach is it gets full after you are putting things into it. It gets full, right? But there's one stomach that never gets full, and that's the stomach of the eye. You can play so many computer games, and you'll, never, you'll get bored, but once you see a new one, you want to try that one out. You can see so many movies and films and soapies, or whatever it may be, but the stomach will never say in the, the stomach of the eye will never say enough now, I had enough. It will constantly take in. Because at the back of his mind, at the back of the eye, there is a storeroom. Right? Not a 16 gig or 32 gig. Or 64 gig. We're talking here about thousand gig or more. It can take a lot of things in. And there he stores it in his subconscious mind. And that sub subconscious mind is an ocean of memory. Now, and memory is important for us. If we corrupt our memory, you've corrupt yourself. Right? As one historian said, if you don't have your memory, is history. So if you don't have memory, you don't know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you don't have any identity. If you don't have any identity, you're nobody. You're nobody. So we need to know who we are. And where do we go to? We go to the Quran, to the Book of Allah. We go to the Sunnah of our beloved Rasulullah. And we go to these beloved companions and to the Tabi'een and the Tabi Tabi'een and all the awliya and then we know who we are. No? That is our identity. Sometimes the blood relation between me and my father, or a father and his son, and a son and his father, sometimes the blood relation is like this. The father is a pious man. The father is a pious man. He loves Rasulullah. He makes lots of dhikrullah. The 
father goes and follow his shaykh wherever his shaykh go, goes and says in majalis and dhikr his father is there where is he? he's in the nightclubs he's on the streets he's in the bad boy cars he's wearing the bad boy clothes I'm not saying there's bad boy clothes out there I mean out there <laughs> mashallah and he's doing, doing all sorts of funny things exactly the opposite of his father by the Sharia, the deeper spiritual meaning of the Sharia, there is no relationship between them. There is no relationship between them. Even though biologically he is the father of that son, by the Sharia, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah says, tell your son to pray, and the son does not pray, we are not going to not pray as well like the sun, but we are going to pray and leave him behind and go. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam. And Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam saw his son climbing up into the mountains and it was storming. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the earth to open its springs and wells and bring water forth from beneath its, its rivers, the rivers that run underneath the earth, bring up water. So water gushed out from the earth, pushed up uh, water from beneath, like a jacuzzi, from beneath. And water came from top, it was raining severely. And he saw his son as the ark is rising up and is now ready to sail. He saw his son climbing the mountain, he said, to his son, لا عاصم لك اليوم من أمر الله. There is no protection for you from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala today. Where are you going? So his son said, سأوي إلى جبل يعصمني. I will go to the mountain top, and there I will be safe. What did he rely upon? He relied upon what he thought in his mind is going to save him. He didn't have the correct understanding. He didn't take from the from his father the the asal, the origin of this deen. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything is possible. Everything is possible. Sayyidina Ibrahim was in the fire. Did he burn? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switched the heat of the fire off. Sayyidina, Nuh, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, he walked through the Red Sea and Allah subhanahu said to the water, uh, he switched the liquidness of the water off and it stood up straight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do anything. Sayyidina Maryam was alone and she became pregnant without a husband. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made her fertile without a husband. Everything is possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't get that aqidah and that understanding from his father. But anyway, he went. So Allah subhanahu so wa ta'ala said, Ya Allah, my son. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, O Nuh, he is not of your family. He is not of your family. Innahu laysa min ahlik. Innahu... But say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to his son not as not your biological son, he's not of your he's not of your ahl, he's not of your group. He is a bad deed. Leave him. He is a bad deed. No. So when we forget our asal, like the son of Noah forgets his asal then there will be a separation between us and our, our origin. And it can sometimes be the other way around. Sometimes the son, mashallah, is practicing and the father is gone. Gone where? You know, he doesn't know the deen. Doesn't practice the deen. Doesn't pray. Never went on hajj. Doesn't have any intention to perform hajj. Now this is the, the type of, you know, things we see in our community. 
this and the one that we mentioned before. And it's hard breaking to see that people have lost their asal and they don't know where they come from, where they belong. No? So we need to know what the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa means to us and how to get it. How to get it. Because sometimes you can try hard and you can uh, uh, try your best to get the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But remember, it's not an easy task. What are there? There are many obstacles in the way, such as dunya, right? Such as what? Such as the shaytan, such as what? Such as your, your hawa, your caprice, this mind that tells you, I think it's like this, it's not like that. You know, they say that this is the way you should, should do it, you know, but it's like this. And the other one is your nafs, your selfish self. These four enemies are pulling you back and away from the sunnah of Rasulullah. The mishkat and nubuwa, the light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is so bright and so, so clear. And wherever it is brought into a community, it brings a guiding light. It's like uh, the, uh, the, the, it's like the, um, the lighthouse. When you come on from a distance, you can't see land and you want to know where you want to go to. And this lighthouse is giving you an indication, come this way, come this way, come this way. And the sea is darkness above you and darkness below you. And the path on the sea is not an easy path because you get winds that blow you from the side to the left and to the right. It might take you away from the coast. But it is that light that tells you, come here, come here, come here. This is it, this is the direction. You know what to do, right? As the captain, you know how to direct the sails, you know how to pull the sails. You know if, if how many engines you need to put on, switch on. If you're men and you're rowing the boat, you can tell the men and guide them. This is how you, but this way, but that way. So ultimately, we nowadays we can't see that light anymore. Sah. Subhanallah, sometimes the light is so bright, I can't see you, like now. MashaAllah. But leave it like that, Sidi. Is, is there a curtain there? It's a beauty of light, Subhanallah. Noorun ala noor. It's the other one, Sidi, that's the noor. So, so what do we have? We can't see the light of Rasulullah, the mishkat and nubuwa, the lamp of Rasulullah sallallahu He's walking with a lamp and we need to follow him. And the dunya is dark. What, what, what darkness are we talking about? We're not talking about this. We're just using the, the, the words metaphorically. You know, we're using the, we're using the words metaphorically. The dunya is dark. What does that mean? It means there's lots of distractions away from Rasulullah. And these, anything that distracts us, distracts us away from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is distracting us away from the darkness, from the, from the light of Rasulullah, meaning it is darkness. So we can't see it. So what do we need to do? It's so either because the community is dark, it's either because the community is dark or inside the heart there is darkness. Some people, they know the haq, they see Rasulullah, they see him, but the community is so dark they get distracted constantly. Sah wala la? The community is so dark. And this is out of our hands. We can't do anything about it. No matter how much you will change the community, it's not going to happen. It's too difficult. It's out of our hands. We say this to parents as well. Oh, mother and father, if you want to change your son and you want to make him a salih boy, 
like uh, Imam uh, Al Ghazali or like for example uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jailani, then uh, there's certain things you need to know. One thing is that the community, if it's bad, there's nothing you can do about it. But there's something you can do about your own home. About your own home. So there are people, they, they find difficulty in seeing the guiding light because of the, because of the community. Some people can see Rasulullah in this darkness, but their hearts are dark. Their hearts are dark and it keeps them behind. Or sometimes the person uh, is lost in this world, in this darkness, and he doesn't know where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, and his heart is dark. You know, this is a big uh, problem for that person. Because he will lose sight of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he will be lost in all of this dunya affairs, and he will be taken away with a, with a, uh, with a tide, and he will end up with a debris. This is the way he will end up. No? And some people, they have clarity in their heart and they, have, and they see Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this darkness. And that is why Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi used to say that the awliya and the salihun and the ulama al-amilun, the ulama that, uh, that practice what they preach, they are in this dunya like stars are on a dark night. When you look up in the, in, the, in, in the sky and you see all blackness, but you see here a little star, there a little star, there a little star. The ulama on this dunya are like that. Are they, there are many of them, but they're all scattered. Right? So this dunya is dark, but these individuals, they are giving you guidance. Like the star also gives guidance to the one who travels across the desert and sails the sea. Allah says in the Quran, and they take guidance from the Nujum, from the, from the stars in the heaven. So, like the one who travels, takes guidance from the stars, so do we take guidance from the ulama who are the stars unto us on the dunya. Um, that is very important. So the person clear out first all of those to get to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to see Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa in this dark, uh, um, dark era. And if the heart is dark, what do we need to do then? We can't do anything about the community. It's dark, halas, but we can do something about the heart. This is the point. We can do something about our own hearts. Now, you walk past the video store and your friends told you about this great game. Everybody's got it. And you're so tempted to go into the game shop and put your money down to buy you that game because to, this is exciting. Right? That is the community. It's dark. But in your heart, if your heart has it, that noor and you have cleared the heart, how? We will talk about that how in a, in a, in a minute. And you've cleared your heart from all of these uh, extra things that you don't need in your heart then you walk past that video store you walk past that game store, shop you won't bother because you've seen Rasulullah you know what he has and he, you know what he gives and you know where he's going to lead you and you know what that video shop or that game shop has and you know what it gives and you know where it's going to lead you. You can clearly distinct between the two. Now, because this heart is your aql, is your tool. Your aql is a tool. You have to use it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you eyes. Use it to read. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a tongue. Use it to make dhikrullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you legs to walk to the masjid. It's all tools Allah gave you. A 
box of tools there and use it. No? If your bike breaks down, breaks down, you've got a bike. And I, I just fixed a couple of bikes the other day. And uh, we did mountain, right, mountain biking, uh, me and my uh, boys, uh, somewhere in, in the woods, Ethan Woods. And I fell, Allahu Akbar. So I can't sit for too long because my, you know, part of my body's. Can you do that? Turn the member around? Yeah. Allah Akbar is a Mojiz. Oh, it's a. Just turn it around then. So we have to do eyes. If I move a little bit to the back, we'll sit on the union. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Bismillah. Bismillah, Rahman, 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 Rahman. So it's that heart that we have that we need to we need to clear out all the old furniture, you know, and how to go about it is very difficult. How to go about cleaning out all of those things that we are attached to? We are attached to the fridge and what's in the fridge and the freezer because the ice cream is in the freezer. And we are attached to the plasma TV. We are attached to our PS3. We are attached to our Wii. We are attached to so many things. They even call it connect. So you're connected to connect. <laughs> they call it connect, don't they? So we are with all of, all of these connections in our heart. So we need to unplug. But it's very difficult to unplug. It's very difficult to unplug from that house and the things we want to do in the house. You know, all, except those people who, you know, we do the house up only for the family, halas, and that's it. We don't want to build an extra uh, room on unless we need it. If we need it, we do it. But we're not going to build it on because my neighbor has recently just built on an extra bed to his house. So mine is standing about out. Look, it looks a bit odd, so I'm going to add on, not two rooms, but three rooms and add an extra bathroom and a new, you know, ceramic, you know, marble shower, whatever it may be, it will last only for an hour. So we, we have this particular competition and our heart is attached to these things, so we need to unplug and disconnect, disconnect from sky, disconnect from broadband. And all of these things are getting more tempta temptatious. Broadband is getting faster. Sky is becoming God. It says it, believe in me, sky. And everything is becoming better and better and better and better. Now, the Ferrari that drove two, a, a decade ago is not as cool as the Ferrari today. Everything is getting more, you know, uh, it fits in with the, with the desires of our nufus. So how to disconnect from it is very difficult. It's very difficult. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us a Rasul that showed us a very easy way. And we need to hold on to his hand and to listen to his step-by-step -step instructions. And once we listen to the step-by-step -step instructions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa all of these things will just wither away. The wind will just wipe, will blow them away. The insignificant in the heart that, is, that has tasted who Allah is, who tasted the love of Rasulullah, the one who looked in the Qur'an and found treasures upon treasures about 
you know, the beauty of Allah and the beauty of the Jannah and the beauty of the reality of this world. Like I told my students today, they were not memorizing the Surah Mulk and they were not memorizing the Waqi'ah and the Yaseen. I told them, if you memorize your Yaseen every single day, this Yaseen and this Mulk and this Waqi'ah is going to remember you tomorrow when you lie in the Qabr. If you're, you're memorizing this surah and forgetting it, you will play outside and you will think, oh, I can't recall this ayah. Let me quickly run inside and open my Quran and check. Oh, that's the ayah. Close it and then I'm going back to play. So this Quran, this memorization has a wisdom. And the wisdom is that you are always connected to the Quran. So when you forget it, Where's the Quran? I need the Quran somewhere. Okay, maybe on the iPad, iPhone there's a Quran. Let me check. Oh, there's the ayah, khalas. And I'm okay. You're constantly connected. So when you're on the Qabr, the Surah Mulk will say, Where is that Fatima or that Hassan that love to come and check up on me? I want to come and check up on, on them while they are laying in the Qabr. I said, What you have is greater then what Mr. Bad will have? No? Freelander discovering the latest tinted windows, fine tracks that comes out of the out of the car. You better than that. How? Ustaji. I said because he can't take that with him in the cover. No matter how much he tried to take the free land with him in the cover, in the fridge, in the pocket sprung mattress, it's not going to work. He has to leave it all behind. It's not going to work. They're going to wrap him up in, in three shrouds and that's it. No? All of those muscles that they showed to everybody is all going to be flat. Like a flat tire. Now, you walk like this, when he's that, dead, everything's in. Right? Nothing's gonna help him. But you're gonna take with you your mulk, your waqia, and your yasin. When you go to your qabr, mulk and yasin is gonna come and ask, where is Fatima, where's Hassan, where's Ubaid? They used to come and open me frequently. They used to play outside or they used to be busy in the kitchen and then they forgot the ayah and they would come back and check what the ayah is and they would close it again and go on. So you have better than what many people have of the dunya. Hold on to the deen. So that dunya, how to get rid of it? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa taught us and he, and he told this to his Sahaba, Sahaba told it to the Tabi'een, the Tabi'een told it to the Tabi Tabi'een, everybody knew it, all those who knew, who are connected with Rasulullah, they knew how to get rid of these things, and they told it to the Salihin and the Awliya, and the Awliya taught it till today, they're still teaching it. And what is that? Dhikrullah Ta'ala. Dhikrullah Ta'ala. What did Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teach a man? A man one day came to Rasulullah and he was also distracted by dunya and other things and he said to Rasulullah, it's a hadith related by Imam Ahmad and he says, a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, qad kathara alayya shara'i'u the Sharia of the Halal and the Haram became too much for me. فَهَلْ لَنَا بَابٌ وَاحِدٌ نَتَمَسَّكُ بِهِ Is it is there one door that we can just hold on to and that will lead us to become practicing Muslimin, fulfilling, filling our lives up with all of these good things that we find so hard to achieve? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa gave him one answer. He said, 
لا يزال لسانك رطبا في ذكر الله سير جنتان نفسيز من ذكر الله سبحانه وتعالى نعم سير جنتان نفسيز من ذكر الله سبحانه وتعالى إذا person sits still and think about this if you do some salat on Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam certain salat is one salat amounts to 500 salat on Rasul to do it ten times is how many? Five thousand salat. To do it one hundred times is fifty thousand salat. Some adhkar, you do it once, you plant for yourself a tree in the Jannah. Some adhkar, you do it once and you build yourself a house in the Jannah. Some adhkar, you do it once and you build yourself a castle in the Jannah. Some salat you do it once and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes all your worries and your troubles out of your heart. No? And who told us this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does this. And did Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make dhikrullah? Yes he did. Kana yadhkurullah fi kulli ahyanihi. He used to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. So what happens with the heart? The awliya, they tell us, that there's a secret passage between the tongue and the heart. The tongue is upstairs and the heart is downstairs. Right? So if the, if the heart wants to go and sleep and slumber, we call it ghafla. Ghafla, heedlessness. He wants to go and not be bothered with this these things, the Sharia, ah, and who Allah is, and who is Rasulullah, doesn't be bothered. Then the tongue starts making a noise, causing a racket upstairs, bouncing up and down. Huh? The tongue bounces up and down, up and down, playing football upstairs in the house. The heart is not going to like that. It says, stop that racket. Quiet. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and gives advice, Udhkurullah dhikran qaleelan or Udhkurullah dhikran kathiran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala little or make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plenty. When you wake up in the morning, throughout your day, after your salah, before you eat, after you eat, when you enter the, the lavatory, when you finish the lavatory, when you wash your hands, when you take wudu, before, in the middle, and after, when you wake up in the morning, there's a dua, several duas. When you go to sleep, start your car, on your way to the masjid, back from the masjid, entering the masjid, out of the masjid, opening the Quran, right? Off with the car, come back with the car, Exit the house, coming into the house. Allahu Akbar. Putting on your clothes, taking off your clothes. Dhikrullah, 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 dhikrullah. Constantly. One day only? No, every day. Every single day. If a person does this every single day, then he will see wonders. He will become one of the Imam al Abdullah al Haddads. He will become one of the Imam uh, Umar ibn Abdurrahman al-Attas Attas's. What will he become? He will become Imam al-Ghazali. He will become who? He will become uh, Imam Abdul Qadir al-Jailani. Now, all of these great Imams that walked on this earth, their starting point was remembrance. And respect for the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only making remembrance, but also to try to internalize it and have respect for it, reverence for it. There is a story of Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr al-Hafi. You all know Bishr al-Hafi? Bishr, the barefooted. Barefooted wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wasn't the wali in the beginning. What was he? He was the guy with a party house in Baghdad. All the fun went on in the house of Bishr al-Hafi. No? 
She invited all the fusaq, all the ones who were heedless. He invited them over to his house. All the party makers, the fun guys, the ones who like this dunya. Come, let's have some party. Wine might have been served. Food is wasted. Servants are ill-treated. And the talk is, not dhikrullah, just dunya, dunya, dunya. And one day Allah subhanahu opened his heart. And he became guided. The dua of one of the awliya, Musa al-Kadhim, it was said, came and knocked on his door and asked his servant, was throwing out food, fresh food out of the door, out of the door. So what tell you, tell you master, asking this question, is he a slave or is he a master? I could ask him a question. Servant went up and he said, you know, somebody with a knock was heard in the, on the door when the servant came and opened it. And Musa al Khadim told him, ask your master, is he a servant or is he a slave? And this question was given to Bishar al-Hafi at that moment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that, that question straight to his heart and it mixed with all of the filth in his heart and it was like a you know, it was like one of those uh, bleaches that you throw in water, just completely takes away all the chemical, all the, the germs in the water. It took away all the germs in his heart. And he realized, you know, I have been in a ghafla. And he ran out to find this man. And he couldn't find him. But he ran out without putting his shoes on. And he remained barefooted until he was going to find this man. But in one of his journeys as he was walking, he saw Allah subhanahu wa name lying on the floor. At this particular moment, Bishar al-Hafi now has changed his life. But did he do it himself? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it for him. And how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the sabab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Saying to him, it was one of the awliya who made dua for him. No. If it's not for the awliya, then we stuck in our habits. And he saw, as, as, as he gave, had this guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him tawfiq. He saw Allah's name on the floor. And he picked it up. Just Allah's name, Allah. He picked it up. And he went to one of the... Uh, the perfume shops, he bought some ghali, ghali is a type of perfume, he put it on there, he says, this name should not be on the floor. This name should not be amongst the dirt. What name was it? It was Allah's name. Picked it up, and where did he put it? He put it in his room, very high, and he left it there. And Bishr al-Hafi went to sleep that night, and he saw a dream. And in the dream, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Ya Bishr, like you raised my, my name high, I will raise your name high in the dunya. And he became one of the greatest awliya. From dunya, love for dunya, he became a lover of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not looking back. Where is the dunya that I left behind? All those clothes, I must those clothes, I must that comfortable bed. A big house, he didn't care anymore. <coughs> right? Is that possible today? Yes, it is possible. Can they become a bishop of happy today? Yes, it's possible. Right? So we need to try to follow the way of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is to clear the heart from all of those extras that we are, extra baggages, those dunya that we have in our heart and throw it out one by one. And it is the way of the Sufis, it is the way of a Mu'min, because a Mu'min sees himself as a traveller. A Mu'min sees himself as a traveller. Where is his starting point? His starting point is when he becomes Mukallaf. This is his starting point. No? And then he travels. Where is he travelling to? He's traveling towards his goal, which is Jannah. It's a long journey. He's traveling from the dunya 
As a matter of fact, he's traveling from the day he's born. He's born into this world. Comes from one world, the world of the womb of his mother. From a tighter world into a more expensive world. And then the dunya becomes tight for him and goes into a more expensive world. The barzakh becomes tight for him and then he goes into the jannah ardu as samawati wal ard. Now the width of it is the, 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 the jannah is as wide as the heavens all put together, the seven heavens, and all the earths put together. Now, مَا لَا أَيْ عَيْنٌ رَاد وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطْرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ What is in the Jannah? The eyes have never seen stuff like that. The ears have never heard things like that. And the heart has never ever imagined things like that, ever. This is in the Jannah. So his goal is there. This is the wise one. His goal is there. This is the one who's got a very intelligent mind. He's going towards that goal. Some people's goal is what? How to get the latest iPhone. Right? Some people are even more narrower than that. What is the greatest app? I want the best app now. I want that game on my phone. I want, I want a better car. These are short term goals. As a matter of fact, they are not even goals. They are just tools that you take. How can a tool be a goal? A spanner. Can a spanner be a goal? A pen. Is that your goal? No, it is what's the ilam. The pen gathers the knowledge. The knowledge is your goal. But not the spanner and the screwdriver. No. So we have to have intelligent goals. So this journey is a long journey. But in actual fact, it's very short. It looks long, but it's extremely short. Some of the old years say, if you take a, if you take, throw a line with your finger in the sand, if you take a knife and you throw a cross, right? That, that line that you drew across with a knife, that is your life in the dunya. What is before it is, what, is, is your life since the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. In the, in, in, the ilm, in the ilm al azali in the, in the time pre eternal. And the line that is after that line that was drawn by the knife, that is your life after your death. This life in the dunya is very short. So the baggages that we take with us should be very light. What is the challenge now when you travel? If you're going to go into the plane with a 250 milliliter shampoo bottle, they're going to tell you to throw it out of your bag. Who's been in general travel journey? Who's, who's flown in the plane? One, two, three, four, five. When you travel, they say, travel light. And if you go to Boots and you go to Superdrug, and you go and you, and you, and you want to buy your, uh, uh, you know, fill up your uh, vanity bag, which is your bag that you put all your shampoo and your stuff in, cream in and stuff like that. They have a special shelf for travelers. What does that all the size? All the size. Small. You might come there with a big, big, uh, you know, you like a Heinz tomato sauce. <laughs> this big one like this size. They're going to come and tell you, come here mate, take it and throw it in a big bun. It says, now you can go, now you can travel. You can't travel heavy to travel light. So when you, drive, when you go to your journey, you make it very easy for yourself. Not too much of this dunya. Your heart must not hold them. Your heart is your bag. It can be in your hand, fine. You can have that, uh, that fridge and everything in it in your hand, that is fine. But when somebody takes it away from you and you have to leave it behind, it's okay, leave it behind. It's not in your heart. You can do without it. Okay? 
So this is the motto. So we're traveling on this journey, we're going towards a goal. And this dunya has to be left behind slowly but surely. How does it happen? Also dhikrullah. Dhikrullah akfir min dhikrillahi sabahan wa masan. Increase with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the mornings and in the evenings. You might sit with your mates and your friends and the only talk that they talk about is what? Is dunya. Dunya, 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 dunya. Day in, day out. Subhanallah. Had they done the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say ten times salat with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi kama la nihayata li kamalika wa ala da kamali. One of these salat, one of salat of tanjina, or one of these other beautiful salat, al-kamaliya, salat al-tibbiya, there's so many beautiful salawat on Rasulullah, saying la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadeer, to say it 100 times is as if he said a slave free. Allahu Akbar. Going into the marketplace, going into places of ghafla. The marketplace is a place of ghafla. Going into these places, what do we say? We say the dhikr of the suq. We say, Allah, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd yuhi wa yumid wa huwa al-hayu al-ladhi la yamud bi yadi al-khair wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadeer. A thousand reward. A thousand darajat has been risen. The, the one who says it has been risen. A thousand darajat. A thousand stations high. A thousand sins has been removed just by saying it once. The Sahaba, they used to leave their home, just go to the souk with their horse and say this dhikr once or twice and come back. Allah This is how serious they took this. Now if a man says this zikr constantly, 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 what do you think is going to happen to that heart? Every single day, he's going to start banging, banging and say, stop it, stop it, stop it. Eventually, the heart's going to give up and without the tongue saying, La ilaha illallah, or Allah, or Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, the heart's going to do it on its own. The heart's going to do it on its own. Subhanallah. The person rides the car and his heart is connected with Allah. Like even Atai al Sakandari mentioned, he said, one of the companions of the Tabi'een, I think it was, was so engrossed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name day in, day out. One day he was walking and he banged his head against a rock. Ouch! And it bled. The blood fell on the floor. And as the blood fell on the floor, it wrote Allah, 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 Allah. Because it's connected with Allah constantly. Right? This is possible. It's just we need to clear that heart from all of that connect. No? We have to unplug. And that will come when a person starts small. Sayyidina Abdullah, it's related to the hadith, I think it's Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, long hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It says, Ala wa inna fi al-jasadi mudgha, idha saluhat, salaha al-jasadu kullu, wa idha fasadat, fasada al-jasadu kullu, ala wa hiya al-qalb. Isn't there an organ in the heart? So there isn't there an organ in the body? If this organ is clear, beautiful, not stale, right? Pure, it's clarity and limpidity, then the whole body will be pure. You won't see stealing on his hand, stealing his filth. No? You don't see him kicking his mother with his feet, because that's filth, that's respectful. No? This body, the lungs, will respond to what is in the heart. If the heart is pure, he will never pick up his feet or his hand for his mom or his dad. 
Never. The tongue is clear. He will never back check to his mother, or his father, or his elders. Because the heart is clear. He, will, he can't do it. Now, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ And if this, this particular organ is stale, it is bad, it's full of filth and diseases, then the whole body will be full of diseases. Okay? The whole body will be full of diseases. Takabur, pride, haughtiness, anger, if these things are in the heart. Hasad, jealousy. Right? All of these diseases in the heart, what, the, what does it cause? It causes to do silly things. If you're angry, you're quickly angered. Start kicking your mother, start eating her. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. If your heart is full of envy, what will you do? Start lying, doing silly things, hating people. Like he bleeds. Envy was in his heart. And he started hating Adam alayhi salam. What happened to him eventually? He got thrown out of the Jannah. Thrown out of the Jannah. Some of the ulama say, or the ulama of tafsir, they say, the Iblis was a beautiful creature. Because Allah subhanahu says in the Quran when he disobeyed, فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا They say, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Iblis to go out of the Jannah, it meant he had to go out, he can't come back in. But actually he came back in. And what did he do? He must let Adam out of his jealousy for Adam. How? Eat from the tree. How did he get back in? Some of the ulama say, no, he never left the Jannah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا It meant, Come out of that beautiful physical appearance that I gave you. Come out of it now. And then he became a shaitan. Ugly. Like a monster. And this is how many of us human beings turn into. You can see it in the eyes. You can see it on the limbs. You can see it in the character. They are a shaitan in si. A human shaitan. A human evil doer. Right? And this is what that bad heart does to the limbs. The limbs become bad. It looks evil. Huh? Who wants to walk with 20 chains hanging around your neck? Huh? Eyes pierced, nose pierced, this pierced, things hanging down from here. How do you look at the end of the day? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Tattoos all over your body. You look like a monster. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. It is what's in the heart. فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا Get out of that beautiful state because there's hasad in your heart, Iblis. There's kibr in your heart. You don't want to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's envy in your heart. Get out of that beautiful state. You don't deserve it. So he was in the Jannah and in that bad state, he looked at himself and his envy grew and grew and grew and grew. His jealousy grew and grew and grew. His anger grew and grew and grew until he said, I'm not going to stop once until all, <coughs> even Adam is misled. This is how bad his jealousy became. And this is the same with Insi. The Insi is the same. No? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our hearts from all this evil. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said at the end of that hadith, that organ, that if it is good, the whole body is good. And if it is bad, the whole body is bad. Allah wa heal qalb. Is it did not the heart? Now we come back to the first thing that we mentioned. Is the dhikr is plenty. Every single day, when you put on your sock and the other sock, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You wake up in the morning, Alhamdulillah illa riyahiyana ba'dama amatana wa la'inu shur. Ten salat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ayatul kursi. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa an khalaqatani wa ana abdu ka dua sayyidu istighfar. You wake up every single morning like this. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to protect you. No serpent is going to bite you. No scorpion is going to bite you. There's not going to be sudden death. Right? When the awliya, in those days, 
The students used to come from far. They never used to be the security that we have now. Climb, uh, get in a plane. Secure, security. You know, we're safe. We sit comfortably in a plane. And then a big karama takes place. Off you go, you fly through the air. Takes you a couple of hours. You reach your destination. You come out from the airport. And your family is there to meet you, or whoever is there to meet you. You get in another car and off you go. In the olden times it wasn't like that. It was very hard. How did the scholars see these hard work that they, that they had done with their students? Five years, seven years, eight years, ten years, they have taught these students all of their knowledge. And here the student is going off, is going back home now. How is he going to get back home? The concern of the teachers was there. What did they used to give them? They used to give them a build. We give you protection. We give you solid protection. Read this word in the evening when you sleep. Read this word when you wake up in the morning. You will get there faster than a super jumbo jet. You read your will constantly and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will push you. And this is what they used to do. These awrad is something we need to try to accumulate. Get them from the sunnah. If you don't have a shaykh, your shaykh will see that you get it. Now he will say, Man laysa wird, fa huwa ird. In other words, fa huwa qird. With the, the qaf is made silent, so they say ird. Qird. If he doesn't have a wird, he's a qird. He's a monkey. Anyway. Is a monkey. Monkey just play around the whole day. So, insha'Allah ta'ala, our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had so many awrad for himself and he was the greatest of the awliya. And the greatest of the anbiya and the greatest of the rusul. And not only that, he was the greatest of Allah's creation. Ala al-idlaq. Without any shadow of a doubt. Right? Yet he had a will for himself. He had a will for himself. He made istighfar every single day, morning and evening. And he didn't have any sin. So we have to keep this up. Now, those of you who have my shaykh, do your wit. Those of you who don't have a shaykh and a tariqah, find out from the wit from our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are at the end of the day one and the same thing. But do make the tongue wet with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you tawfiq. One of the great awliya, uh, Sidi Ahmad al-Alami, he said, Al-dhikr sababu kulli khair. The dhikr is the reason for every good that comes in a person's life. Allah Inshallah wa ta'ala, we will end on that inshallah wa ta'ala. And if we, want to, if we want to bring in the sunnah in our life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, start with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open our hearts to find the sunnah and we can see the light, we can see the, the truth and the wisdom behind Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa words. Makes sense. You can feel it, you can taste it. And it tastes nice. Now, what you've got, if you, if, if you want to eat the good food, right? The good food is beneficial to your body. But your mouth is still full of Pepsi Max. You're not going to enjoy your good food. Pepsi Max, and uh, you've got an extra, you've got an extra in your mouth. You're chewing at the extra. Now, when mom is putting the food on, the salad doesn't taste nice. Because you had the had had extra in your mouth. Take it out, wash your mouth, clean it out, and then you're going to taste the nice food. So, and if you had an ice cream, and you had a chocolate, a Mars bar, and a pack of crisp, and you had what else? What do we eat nowadays? Huh? What do we drink? Lucozade. <laughs> when that's in the, in, the, in the stomach, your stomach is full. You're not gonna, you're not gonna like that food. So what do you have to get rid of that first? Get rid of that. Come with an empty stomach to the table. And then you're gonna enjoy the food. Empty, hungry stomach to the table, and then the food is gonna taste nice. 
Don't come with that stomach that's filled with, uh, with Doritos and uh, 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 Lucuse and all of these things. No, 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 no. Then you're not going to enjoy the food. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. When I speak about Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the fourth Khalifa of this Ummah, of the Mu'mineen, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, Ihda al Rijal al Mubasharin bil Jannah. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu is one of the men that Allah subhanahu that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that will be of the Ahlul Jannah whilst they are still in the dunya. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu <coughs> this big debate between the ulama hard and debate whether he was the greatest of the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim or Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I always say this what will Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu would have said if he had seen people debating whether he is the greatest radiallahu ta'ala anhu Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala is the greatest. And what would Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu say would have said if he had seen people debate whether he is the greatest <laughs> or Ali ibn Abi Talib. What do you think? Huh? They would have said, these lot are crazy. What are they debating about? Right? Ali is the greatest, Abu Bakr will say. Abu Ali will say, Abu Bakr is the greatest. And that is the alama, that is the sign of, yani, uh, the sign that the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim were of such humble nature that they, they would never want to raise, them, raise themselves above anybody else. Now, and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum was of this kind. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum would say if, if it was said that all people will enter into Jannah except one man, then I would have feared that I might be that man. Subhanallah. This is a man, whenever he thought of something, it was, in the, in, it was within accordance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation. With thoughts so humble about himself. And there are people today that have nothing under their belt. Nothing. Five daily salah. There's nothing. Subhanallah, sadaqah, zakah. There's nothing in comparison to what these Sahaba did. But then we think we are somebody. So what, we, what can we learn from these, uh, these companions? We can learn some humbleness. Yet, at the same time, they were of the greatest of the great. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was the youngest to embrace Islam. He was a young man in his early teens. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And at that time already, Allah gave him and bequeathed him with the wisdom to see that this, what my cousin is talking about, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, is the haqq. Naam is the haqq. I'm not going to stand. I'm not going to refuse this. I'm going to take it. Now, this man was born in Makkah, alayhi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he was born where in Makkah? Sayyidina Ali was born in the Kaaba. Allahu Akbar. He was born in the Kaaba, in the center of Makkah. Allahu Akbar. His mother's name was Fatima binti Asad, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, she embraced before the Hijrah, his mother. And obviously, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu married the bid'a, bid'a, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the part of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Fatima binti Muhammad, Fatima Sayyida Fatima binti Muhammad radiallahu ta'ala anha. 
it was his wife and from here he had beautiful children sibtay rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rahanatay al jannah the nephews of rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hasan and hussein he is the father of them too and he and the, uh, he is the father of the the sayyida shabab bi ahl al jannah he is the father of the Sayyid, the masters of the young men of, of Jannah. He is the father of the young men. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, They are the Sayyids, the masters of the young men in the Jannah. Who's the daddy? Ali ibn Abi Talib. No? Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam considered him to be like Harun used to be to Musa. Ali, you are like me, like Harun used to be to Musa alayhi salam. What a great maqam. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu one day in the battle of Khaybar, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was coming to attack Khaybar. Khaybar had 10,000 strong army. It's only the front. They were all archers. Archers. Imagine... 10,000 arrows raining upon you. What kind of, you know, how are you going to beat this? Never did the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim fight an enemy like Khaybar. They were fearful. As a matter of fact, the Arabs around Medina, they were all happy. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to attack Khaybar. Why? For a good reason? <laughs> no! For a bad reason, they said, we are happy he's going there because now he's going to meet his end. He doesn't know what Khaybar is. They talk of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as, he, as a man that doesn't know anything. What did Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know? You tell me. What did he know? <coughs> Better than anybody else. You know, Allah. <laughs> I can go alone and beat them up. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can go alone and beat them up if he wanted to. He doesn't need the Sahaba. Because he's got Allah with him. If you want to make a dua and say, Allah send upon them rain from fire upon them and kill them all. Or let the earth swallow them in. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuse to, to, to answer that? No. You could have gone in alone. But Rasul sallallahu is teaching the ummah something. He went into Khaybar and what did he do? How many men did he take to Khaybar? Against 10,000. I'll give you all one guess. 1,600. 1,600 men, 1,600 against 10,000. But he was clever, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His heart was connected with the power of Allah, not with the power of these 100, 1,600 men. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yeah, sahaba, naam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is my superpower. You know? In the Sahaba, I was teaching the Sahaba, when you enter in a battle, you don't rely upon yourself. You are nothing. You are nothing. So what did Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? He didn't choose any Sahabi. He chose Sahaba that knew this concept. Because Khaybar, what was Khaybar? Khaybar was, uh, you know, Khaybar was so wealthy and so rich that if Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have announced a month in advance, listen, we're going to go in a month, we're going to go and take Khaybar. Because they have been annoying. We're going to take them. You know what the people have said? The weaker ones especially, they would say, now is my time to become rich. I always wanted to have a part of Khaybar, of the land of Khaybar. I always wanted a certain area of Khaybar when I used to travel through it. SubhanAllah, the beautiful landscape. 
You know, I wanted a part of it. Oh. But it was not that that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was after. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to open the door toward Sham and give da'wah to Sham. Khaybar was an obstacle there. Da'wah had to flow freely to all nations. This, da- this deen is not made, in, made to just rest here in Medina. It's made to go everywhere around the globe. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa didn't announce anything. Just two days before. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the companions that wa- went with him on the Umrah when the Umrah when they were refused to enter to, com- to, 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 for, for, to complete the Umrah uh, there was an issue uh, Sayyidina Uthman was, was kidnapped and the word went out that they killed Sayyidina Uthman and Sayyidina Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at his companions and he saw men in white no weapons with them only the weapons that you travel with. You know, weapons that, you know, when you travel and you want to slaughter something, what are you going to slaughter? A you know, knife. No? You want to shoot and uh, catch a uh, rabbit or something, you're going to shoot it with an arrow. These, uh, these are not war weapons, travel weapons. They stood there and there were only a few men and a few women. And these women said, We, Ya Rasulullah, are behind you. We will stay and fight. Even though we don't have weapons, we will fight with you and we will get Uthman back radiallahu ta'ala anhu and they made bay'ah one after the other under the tree in Makkah and that bay'ah was called bay'atu shajara and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked at the people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said laqad radiyallahu alil ladina yubayi'una ka tahta shajara Allah says in the Quran today everybody reads that Allah has been satisfied with those who made bay'ah with Muhammad under the tree. Who were the Sahaba? Two days before Khaybar, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa informed that crew only. Only them lot. Was these lot, they know that when we enter into battle, it's not our strength that matters. They knew the concept. There's a lot of other, you know, weaklings in Medina. Mashallah, even though the Sahaba, they're mightier than us. But Rasul Sallallahu took only them in and he conquered them. In that battle, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Tomorrow I'm going to give the flag. This guy is going to walk through all of those arrows. 10,000 archers. <coughs> and they practiced a month in advance. They heard Rasul. They, they speculated Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi to come for them. So they had the archers march back and forth in two exercises in preparation for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi coming. Alright? Now who's going to go with the flag and take the flag in? Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, there's a man tomorrow who's going to take this flag in. He's, he loves Allah and he loves his Rasul and Allah and his Rasul loves him. Ooh, Allahu Akbar, Sahaba, Ridwanullah Alayhim. They, they couldn't sleep that night. Why? Because they all thought, who can this man be? Who is this man that's going to walk through all of these men towards the doors of the fortresses of Khaybar, heavily fortified? Who's going to walk with the, with the flag in this condition? Dangerous conditions, huh? Everybody slept. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala and said, I couldn't sleep that night. I was thinking, who is this man? And then the, f- the morning came and Rasulullah sallallahu gathers his sahaba and the men are ready to march. How many? 160? Uh, 1,600? Where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? Allah. Sahaba they were anxious to hear what, who is this man? And say, now Umar even stood on the top of his toes so Rasul sallallahu can see him. Aina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where's Ali? Allahu Akbar. And Sayyidina Ali was not well that day. He was not well. His eyes were hurting. He came to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, spat in his eye. 
put from his saliva al mubaraka in the eye of Sayyidina Ali, rubbed over it, and the eye became back and better than it was before. Here's the flag, Ali, march. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala took the flag, and this is what he did. He marched. Now he is executing the command of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He marched, he marched, he marched. In a couple of 10 or 15 steps, he said, Ya Rasul Allah, he didn't turn around because he didn't want to disobey. Turning around means, you know, you are not fulfilling the command of Rasulullah. You are turning around. Now why? Because I said, March. Why are you turning around? Sayyidina Ali radiallahu took that, that standard and he stood still. He said, Ya Rasulullah, how shall I fight them? And he shouted loud. كَيْفَ أُقَاتِلُهُمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ How shall I fight them? قَاتِلْهُمْ حَتَّى يَشْهَدُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ Fight them until they say, أَشْهَدُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ Allahu Akbar What was the result? Every single fortress of Khaybar, the seven fortress were opened. To the barak of that man. Allahu Akbar. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a great status. By Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he holds a very big maqam. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, and Ibn Hajar al Asqalani says the hadith sahih. Ana Madina tul ilm. I am the door of knowledge, I am the city of knowledge. Wa aliyun babuha. Wa aliyun. Babuha. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu of all of the companions and with all the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu an insight and an understanding of the overarching rules over the sharia. Rules that will guide you to make the correct decisions. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was well versed in it. Yet, he said this, Allahu Akbar, he said, I will never live in a town when Abu Hassan is not there. I will never live in a town is of Abu Hassan, Abu Hassan, who's Abu Hassan? Sayyidina Ali. If he is not there, I will not live in a town. Khalas. Why? Because Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala he also said this. He said, there were so many mu'dilah, difficult masail, I could not find the answer from anyone except from Abu al-Hasan. And when a mu'dilah, when a, when a masala was extremely difficult, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to say, mu'dilah, وَلَيْسَ لَهَا أَبَا الْحَسَنِ Yes, he says, this is such a difficult situation, such a difficult masala, that Abu al-Hasan can't even solve this. It's like he would say, this particular scientific concept is so intricate, even Einstein can't understand it. Hmm? Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was very respected Sayyidina Ali tremendously. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu married his daughter Umm Kulthum to Sayyidina Umar. <coughs> One day Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu came. You know Umar. <coughs> Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to be... Uh, you know, you, you know a uh, neighbor would watch. It comes from Sayyidina Umar. It comes from this man. Sayyidina Umar did neighbor would watch. Your... HMRC, Her Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs, Sayyidina Umar. Your vaccinations that you do before you go abroad, Sayyidina Umar. You know, all these benefit system that we have today here, there's benefits for families, work, working families, people don't have jobs, people in the army, where does it come from? Sayyidina Umar. It's called the Diwan. Sayyidina Umar laid them out. But with whose advice? This man. 
Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu's advice The books of Sira and Tariq Ibn Kathir, Khaldun, Ibn Athir and Imam Abu Ta'a, Imam At-Tabari They all say Sayyidina Ali used to come and give advice Sayyidina Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu wanted to uh, uh, go and fight in the great battle against the Persians it was one of the greatest battles that took place against the Persians it happened in the time of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala and wanted to take part of it he wanted to take part in this battle and uh, he, came see, so, uh, he came to seek advice from Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Ali told him this Ya Amirul Mu'mineen stay in Medina you are you are the center of this government. <coughs> if you fall, this government falls. And this is how Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described Sayyidina Umar. Sayyidina Umar is Quflu Babul Fitna. He is the padlock on the door of the fitan. The padlock on the door of the fitna. And one day Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman came and said, Ya Qufl Bab al-Fitna. He called Sayyidina Umar, Oh, the padlock of the door of the fitna, the, the, the door of the, uh, of the fitna. He said, Aba Hudayfa, this door, will this door be broken down or will it be opened? He's asking Abu Hudayfa, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, who was the one who kept the secrets of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is he? He is the one who keeps the secrets of the government. MI6, MI5. Abu Hudayfa uh, ibn al-Yaman. He could go into a, into a camp and come out without the people of this enemy camp know a thing about him. He did that uh, in the battle of uh, the confederates. The Battle of the Trench. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, this door will be broken down. What did he mean? He asked Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, Will this door be open? Will this door give in to the fitna? Or will this door not give in and it will be broken down by the fitna? Hudayfa ibn al Yaman said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, it will be broken down. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy now. So, you stay where you are. Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Umar al Khattab, you stay where you are and don't go any further. You are the main guy, you stay here. You make idara, you organize everything. And we are here to assist you. We are wuzara, we are advisors, wazir, wuzara, we are members of your parliament. Khalas, Sayyidina Umar stayed, he didn't go. Then, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had to start dating his letters, dating it, and write a date. The one who told Sayyidina Umar, he said, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, it is time that we start dating our letters and our documents. Who was this? Sayyidina Ali. And Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala came with his mind and said, we start from the day we made the hijrah and there is the time that is the time when our islamic calendar starts who is he who is he? who is the one who who came up with the idea ya amirul mu'mineen we have to start dating our letters amirul mu'mineen ali ibn abi talib one day sayyidina umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu climbed on the roof of, a, of, an, of another guy he's amirul mu'mineen night watch coming back to night watch Amir al Mu'mineen, night watch, climb on the roof of somebody's house. And he found the guy in his house who was doing something haram. He says, What are you doing? Stop what you are doing, and you are going to be punished for this. This man said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you are right, I'm doing wrong. One wrong, but you are doing four wrongs. Quiet, Amirul Mu'minin. First of all, 
You didn't greet me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa idha dakhaltu. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, if you enter into the house, fasallimu ala ahliha. You didn't greet me. We say, Assalamu alaikum. That's your first wrong. Wa'atul buyuta min abawabiha. Enter the houses from the door. Where are you? You're on the roof. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And don't spy on people. But what are you doing? You're spying on me. I'm in the confines of my house. Now, in the fourth one, Ya Amirul Mu'minin, where's your witnesses? You don't have any witness. So go away. He said, Stop doing what you are doing. Stop what you are doing and go. Uh, and then stop it. And Amirul Mu'minin got off the, from the roof and he went. So he went to say, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What shall I do? I caught so and so doing so and such and such. What shall I do? He said, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, you can only make Amr bil Ma'roof, but even though you are the leader, like the supreme judge amongst us, like Judge Goldstone, if he some, sees somebody doing something wrong, you know who Judge Goldstone is? He's a big daddy judge here in this country. Nobody can sit on top of him, he's a main guy. If he sees somebody doing wrong, he can't go and accuse a guy. <coughs> that guy can say, well, you we don't have any witnesses. Where's your proof that I've done it? So Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu told him, Ya Amir al you can only bring that man into court if you have two witnesses. Ya two witnesses. And if you don't have any two witnesses, you just only have to do Amr bil ma'aruf and nahi anil munkar and that's it, khalas. This is the relationship between Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Ali. But, was this relationship with him and say, with Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Abu Bakr? Yes. And this is also a moment, a place of controversy. Because Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu told the wife of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu is Sayyida Fatima binti Rasulullah. When Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conquered Khaybar, there was another place. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam close to Khaybar. Wealthy. Wealthy community. I mean, the amount of produce that they, 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 they pushed out every year of dates and different kinds of dates. The Sahaba said when Rasulullah came back from Khaybar and Fadak, we never used to live the life of poor people. We never used to live the life of poor people. Allahu Akbar. The dates in Medina is this size, the dates of Khaybar is this size. Right? Allahu Akbar. So if you have one date in Khaybar, <laughs> you have actually five dates of six dates of Medina. Allahu Akbar. So there was another area called Fadak. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conquered that as well. Belonged to the Yahud, but they were also very uh, conspiring against Islam. Conquered that. And apart from that, supposed to have been for Sayyidah Fatima. When Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, she wanted that. And Sayyidina Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, whatever the prophets own after their death belongs to the ummah. Hadith sahih. No? Hadith Sahih. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala didn't know that. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu knew that. And he said, Ya Fatima, uh, Ya Binti Rasulullah, that is not yours. And there were other belongings of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa All belongs to the Ummah. Some ulama say, yes, this is what made her upset. But it's not that that made her upset. It was actually another thing that made her upset. It is because the people thought that she was upset over that and they were not happy with Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu making that, giving that fatwa based on what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. These people upset her. <coughs> and she was upset because of that. But Sayyidina Fatima didn't have any dunya. This is the uh, the, the inside of the awliya. No? Weaklings. There's always weak ones amongst the good ones. 
when Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, so Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there was not close relationship in the beginning. Because Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was more uh, concerned with his beloved wife Fatima binti Rasulullah and his family at that moment. She was also very ill and six months after the, the, the wafat of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she passed away. And then Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu came and sort of uh, showed his allegiance to Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Full allegiance. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu yani, had the support of Sayyidina Ali. And when Zaydi bin Thabit wa was uh, decided to uh, go into Sham to fight, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was one of the main contributors in, in terms of opinion and, and, and ideas, how to send that army forward, Ya Amirul Mu'min, this is my ideas. This is not Sihah that it, I think we should give Zaid ibn Thabit. When it was with the Hurub al Ridda, to the battles against the Murtaddin, those who apostated, those who refused to give their zakah money, now Muhammad is dead, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now we can, we can turn our backs on this deen, khalas. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala was heavily involved there. But people say, well, and this is where we have to be very, very much aware of the relationship between Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, because people like to rub their hands together and say, well, Abu Bakr, he refused this from Sayyidina Ali, he took his khilafa, it was his turn. It was his time to be Khilafah and Abu Bakr took it radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It's not true. It is nonsense. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually made twice bay'ah. Bay'ah in secret. So let's say na, Sayyidina Fatima uh, not be upset because obviously that is his wife. He goes back to his wife and in the house, you know, if you upset your wife and then you, know, you can get in trouble. So Sayyidina Ali was clever, he played the game and his cards very good. That we call siyasa, we call it siyasa. You know, to, to play the cards so good that you are not stabbed in any way. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala made bay'ah again with Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu to confirm that. But one thing beautiful happens. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala requests Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala to come speak to Sayyidina Fatima in the house. And he speaks to her and he makes her understand everything. And Sayyidina Fatima is appeased. She is happy. And accepts the Khilaf Abu Bakr and everything goes on very well. To make things even better, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhum was married to a woman, Fatima binti Umaysh, and he divorced her. From Fatima binti Umayyish had a son from Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his name was Muhammad, now the second, the half brother of Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he divorced her. These things happened. Now, what did Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu do after his wife passed away? The single man has got kids. What did he do? He married the ex-wife of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and she was an armala. She was an old woman and he married her. And Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr became the stepson of Sayyidina Ali. Do we know this? And Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr became a good student and learned, took that ilam and knowledge from Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu because he's a rabib, he's a stepson, he's a, the rabib, he's in the lap of his mother, but under the house of Sayyidina Ali. And he became one of the great supporters of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala throughout his khilaf. <coughs> so people will come with all sorts of Dodgy ideas that says, well, Abu Bakr should be Khalifa, Ali should have been the Khalifa. My say is this, inshallah, I will end off with this because there's so many to say. We haven't come yet to how Sayyidina Ali was in the time of Sayyidina Uthman. 
right? And how things turned out for Sayyidina Ali when he came in Khilafah. Oh, what a difficult state the Ummah was in. We have to understand these issues because we just don't want to hear Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala and whose name we say, MashaAllah, he is a son in law of Rasulullah. MashaAllah, and he was the father of Hassan and Hussein. That's not the only things we want to know. We can know that about Justin Bieber and other people. Huh? Zain Malik. But not about Sayyidina Ali. Not about Sayyidina Ali. We want to know everything. Everything. Like Rasulullah, we want to know everything. We can't know enough about them. Right? So when we hear these people debate, we say, Khalas. If we had Sayyidina Uthman and Sayyidina Ali in front, and we would ask, who is the better of you two? Then what would have happened? Both would have said, you are greater than me. You should be Khalifa. Allahu Akbar. And this is what happened between the ulama that have piety and ilm. Sayyidina, Sayyidina uh, Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Imam al-Thawri, they once had a debate. Sayyidina Imam al-Thawri was, was one of the great ulama. He had a madhab of his own. And Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi'i had a madhab of his own. And the debate was about what shall we do with the skin of a dead animal. Right? Can we tan it and make it clean? Or is the skin in the animal, the dead animal that was not slaughtered, huh? fell from a cliff or something like that? Is everything najis and should be buried? The debate happens between these scholars. What happens? Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi comes and says, no. The animal with its skin is all najis, it should be buried and discarded. And Sayyidina Imam al comes and he says, No, the animal is Najis, but the skin can be used. And both of them give their Dalil. And the debate goes on. After the debate, Al-Shafi took the opinion of Imam al thawri and al thawri took the opinion of Imam al-Shafi'i. And that's how the debate ended. Allahu Akbar. If two... We call them juveniles in comparison to Imam Ali and Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. These two. If they can come to an agreement like that, what about these two men? If their ilam that they possess could bring them together like this, okay, your opinion makes more sense to me, I'll take it then. And Imam al says, your opinion as Shah makes more sense, I'll take it then. And then they parted. If they can be with their ilam, uh, reconcile in such a good manner. What about these two great men? You know, we don't want to listen to too much debate because debate on controversies, Imam Abu Hanifa, we should say is a bid'ah. Imam Abu Hanifa didn't like it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we know and what we've heard about Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and about Sayyidina Umar and about Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Uthman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bequeath us through His mercy and through His largesse and lutuf a part of their taqwa and a part of their iman and a part of their adherence to the sunnah and a part of their wisdom and a part of their ilm, their knowledge. And to make us strong mu'mineen like them, to make us people that stood steadfast on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of Rasulullah like them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His hands lies all tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the faith to fulfill our duties as mu'mineen. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf wa matanin sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rabbana laka alhamd kama yambaghi li jilali wajika wa li azimi sultani subhanaka la nuhsitana an alayka anta kama atnaita ala nafsik. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allah maghfir lana. ذنوبنا وذنوب والدينا ومشايخنا ولجميع المسلمين أجمعين ربنا يسر ولا تعسر ربنا تمم خير وأنت يا الله الكريم يسر اللهم فعلنا ما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا الحمد لله على كل حال ونعوذ بالله من حال أهل الضلال ورحمتك يا رحم الراحمين الحمد لله رب العالمين